but one of the issues, and it's not really a question that I have here, but it's, it's the role of time in this whole process. And that is that a lot of people, they're thinking of fairly short time horizons when they're investing. And so it's really time is, is like an essential component of the whole thing in making, um, getting these types of returns from the stock market and so forth. You have to be able to hold for the long term. Yes, and, and, and not go for the short-term type of hold. That's what a lot of people do. They're, they're looking for these short little plays, and then really what they're doing is they're gambling uh, in the stock market. Yes, Mike. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. If we could have the next slide. This slide is a demonstration uh, of how professional money managers are unable to uh, beat a simple buy and hold of the market. So this study is done by Standard & Poor, a financial uh, analysis company, who also build index funds, the most famous of which is the S&P 500. What they showed over the last five years ending December of 2008, that in fact 69% of the large cap money managers are unable to beat their S&P 500 index. 78% of the small cap managers underperformed their S&P small cap index. And 87% uh, of the international managers underperformed. So the secret is trying to find a money manager who is in the top 10 or 20% of all money managers. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to do that consistently and I don't know anybody else that can do that consistently. So that's part of the problem is the consistency. So they may beat in a particular year but, uh, but to do it like two years in a row is extremely difficult. And then to do it for three is like almost impossible. Almost impossible. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that the same study by Standard & Poor went through the year 2008. And uh, part of the sub-study proved that the um, money managers were unable to outperform the index even during significantly down markets. So it is a a thought that if you hire a professional money manager, you're able to pick a manager that can study the market and get you out of the down markets. Mm -hmm. That was not true in 2008. The average money manager, as shown by Standard & Poor, underperformed a simple buy and hold of the benchmark. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, I've heard from some of these uh, people that represent the asset management funds, uh, they say, you know, this is a stock picker's market, you know, we've got a down market like this. This is when we can really show, you know, the value that we have to add. But, but yeah. the, the history has shown that that's just not the case. History shows that they are not able to pick stocks and time the trades and know the future prices better than just, anybody else. Okay. Well, then here's the question that's probably on a lot of people's minds. How can you time the market to maximize gains? <laughs> Timing, timing the market and maximizing the gains is, again, an emotional decision uh, by investors. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's okay to have the emotions of fear, panic, or greed. It's just not okay to make decisions from them. So what investors want to do is get out of the down markets, but they want to be in the up markets. Right. What that demands is two choices. If we could have the next slide up there, does not lightning strike twice? Because what we need to point out is that market timing requires two decisions, and the investor has to be right each time. They need to know when to get out, and they need to know when to get back in. Mm -hmm. And if you'll sh bring up the next slide for the viewers, what it points out is that it's more important to be time timing, that it's more important to have time in the market mm -hmm. than to be trying to time the market. Mm -hmm. So for the 30-year period ending 2008, if investors had bought and held the S&P 500 for every thousand dollars that they had in the S&P 500, they would have three million four hundred and forty thousand dollars today. Wow. If during that 39, almost 40-year time frame, mm -hmm. investor, any investor had chosen to just get out of the market on one day and get mm -hmm. back in and stay in the next day. Mm -hmm. And that one day they were out of the market was the very best trading day or the highest return on the market mm -hmm. for investors in that one day that they were out in cash. They would have a 
nearly $330,000 potential loss of gain in their portfolio just from missing that one day. Wow. If investors missed 15 of the best trading days over that 40-year period, they would get almost one-third the return of a simple buy and hold. One-third? One-third of the total return by simply buying and holding the marketplace. And being out how many days? 15 days. By just being out 15 days. <laughs> so a person spends their lifetime invested in the stock market to experience 15 days, more or less, and uh, those 15 days are going to determine half to two-thirds of their total net worth. Holy mackerel. That's, that is huge. For any investor to know what those days are would just be unrealistic. Uh -huh. So you got to be in. Uh, Rather than trying yeah, to time the market. Yeah, okay. So if we could have the next slide, please. The, the, the result of trying to time the market, as we've seen, produces inferior returns. Not only can the professional managers not time the market well, neither can the individual managers. Mm -hmm. If we could turn the page one more time um, to the next slide. The sad story of the average investor points out that through 2007, if you'd purchased the stock market and held it for, 30, for 20 years, mm -hmm. you would have a return of 11.8% per year. The average equity investor only earned 4.5%. So even through the market downturn, mm -hmm. they're unable to gain any advantage in trying to time the market. It just doesn't work to try and get out of the market. It takes two decisions to be able to get the returns of the market if you do that. So you have to make the decision when to get out and when to get back in. And if you're out, when you've got one of those big days that happen on an un unexpected time, those 15 then days. you've missed it. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so it has a, a big effect on your return. But I mean, we just went through this thing where we, well, we also saw this big slide and that, of course, had to cut back a lot of the returns for those people that were trying for those long-term holds and so forth. And I, I'm sure, you know, I know that you went through some difficult times even with your clients trying yes. to get them to hang on. Yes, um, um, proud to say that 100% of our clients stayed in the market. Wow. That's our job is to help clients stay in the market. Well, good for you. The, the, the history of market movements is that during the down cycle, more money leaves the market each down cycle than in the previous down cycle. So that happened between December of 2008 and March of 2009. More money left the market than had been than in previous market history. Wow. What that means is that investors are selling out at least close to, if not at the bottom uh -huh. of the market. I don't know where the bottom is or was, uh -huh. but if and when it occurred, it probably has been close to the current, current date. Yes. Okay. So 